couple of things. There we go. I want to get started with a couple of things, and then I want to pause for a moment of prayer together. First of all, I, I, I can't let this uh, slip by. Well, there's a couple of things that you need to know about. One is that uh, tomorrow is Pastor Donnie's birthday. And um, two, uh, a prayer need that uh, Gerald and Ethan headed down to Roanoke to see Gerald's dad uh, yesterday. Gerald's dad, Jerry, is not doing so well. You guys know he's been suffering with cancer for some time, and his wife, Betty, needs some uh, prayer and comfort, too, so please keep him in mind in, in just a few moments when we go to prayer. And also, um, we need to welcome a, a brand new visitor with us today, and I think that is um, baby Peyton, right? Peyton? Peyton. Angel and Adam Barnes, new baby. She came into the world a week ago? A week ago, okay? So uh, everybody very quietly say, hi, Peyton. And um, before we officially get started here, we're finishing the book of Genesis today. We're going to be in the last part of chapter 49, and we'll focus on one specific place in chapter 50. But we're finishing up this, this um, entire sermon series, this teaching on God's providence. And what I hope has happened, just a few miscellaneous notes, what I hope has happened is that over the course of these several weeks, you've seen um, some of my convictions about Scripture, that God is at work and involved in the universe, knee-deep knee and elbow-deep into it. If you believe that, would you say amen? The question has been, what does that mean? How is he at work? Because uh, over the several, last several years, in fact, I've been trying my best to confront a teaching that's out there that every bad thing that happens in the universe has somehow come from God and he's to blame for it. Somebody gets a flat tire and they immediately go, oh God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Somebody gets sick or needs knee surgery and I don't know why God's doing this to me. Somebody gets cancer or something bad happens financially. I don't know what God's doing. But when we read the Bible, is that what we find? God's business is going around giving people cancer, giving them flat tires, and giving them the sniffles? Is that his work? In fact, we have an answer for why those things happen. We find it very early in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, that God created a universe in which human beings would be able to be free, to choose to obey him or choose to disobey him. They had a free choice. When they chose to disobey him, sin came into the world, and with it, death and evil sickness and corruption. These things happen. We understand this. At the same time, we know it's more complicated than that, isn't it? Because God is involved and God is at work. And we'll talk more about what we mean, our definition, in just a minute. Um, but it's become a more popular teaching among Christians that, that God is even directly responsible for evil. That's become a much more popular thing over the last 15, 20 years even. That somehow we, God is to blame for those things as well. And one of the passages that comes to mind quickly is Isaiah 6, passages in Revelations, where angels are standing or flying around the majestic throne of a holy God, shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they've been shouting that for forever, and they're going to continue to shout that. And you and I want to blame him for killing children. You and I want to blame him. For these, I don't think I would say that to his face. Maybe there's another way to take it. My point in this teaching is that there is another way to take it. There is another way to understand how all this works. How is it that God is completely involved, and yet we don't have to go, well, God did that to you, so there must be a reason. God does allow things to happen, and sometimes he gets directly involved. He punishes, doesn't he? And sometimes he moves directly to help and to bless He's like a father in that way. He's upholding creation, sustaining. But I hope you've been with me to try, to try to work out those nuances as we've gone. For those of you who are Bible nerds like me, uh, this might be interesting. There's a lot of great books to read. There's a lot of not great books to read. Here's one that will stretch your brain a little bit. It's called Divine Providence by Bruce Reichenbach. And this is a lot of great things about God's providence, how he works. And this man is committed to some of the theological convictions that I am about that. And so that's why I really, I've really enjoyed it. And he also even talks about prayers and miracles. And how those things, how does God decide when he's going to use a miracle, when he's not? 
how does, when he's answering prayers, why does it seem like a lot of our prayers are unanswered, and sometimes they are, and sometimes quickly, and sometimes they're not. All those things we've been talking about, and he uses tons of illustrations. This will be a workout for you if you decide to invest in it. But that's why I've been trying my best to um, hang around after service, those types of things, so we can bounce some of these thoughts off of one another and continue to work through them because suffering will happen to you. Evil will happen to you. And in shallow Christianity, the knee-jerk reaction is, God, you did this, and now I don't believe in you anymore. And I'm going to be mad at you for the rest of my life. Very shallow because it hasn't searched the scriptures about how, in fact, God works through the providence and what he has promised and what he hasn't. Right, everyone? Okay. All right. So all those things, just keep those in mind. But let me um, move now to focus a little bit more on today's passage and something a little lighter. How many of you um, have a vehicle that requires constant attention and constant upkeep? Okay. Uh, how many of you have a machine that requires constant attention and constant upkeep? Anybody have? A, how many of you have had? Have had? Okay. Um, hands are dirty often. Hands are dirty in those things. Uh, sometimes very frustrating to you. Yes. When you do manage to get it fixed, how does that feel? It'll work a little while longer, right? Uh, what happens if you slack off? Say, well. I don't have to give this constant attention or constant upkeep. What happens if you don't give it constant attention and constant upkeep? What happens? It gets, wor it gets worse and worse. Worser and worser. It breaks. It dies. So you're thinking about something specific. Are you plant life? <laughs> something. Your car dying. Okay. What else? You get stranded. It gets expensive, maybe more so because you didn't were watching it. Yes, good. Then you understand providence. You're like I do. Yes, you do. The universe is this vehicle that we think. Yes, God created it with natural laws that will continue to work the way they're working, mostly. But the universe and atoms themselves don't have the ability to continue on their own without help, without being sustained, without being preserved. This is a teaching from the Bible, by the way, that God is actually upholding the universe, elbows, elbow deep, involved, constant upkeep, constant uh, maintenance, constant attention. Okay, so if you've got none of the other illustrations that we've been using, we could use that one, right? So if you are sitting around the dinner table, kids, we've been talking about providence in church. That's pretty deep. Can you tell me what that means? No. Well, here's one. You know that vehicle we have? Yeah, that your baby, Dad. Your ba yeah, you know that? And then you, uh, that's providence. Constant attention. So aren't you glad that the Bible teaches us that the one true God who created the universe is giving it constant attention and constant upkeep? It's not going to fly off into outer space. It's not... The sun's not going to burn out. We're not going to destroy the planet with nuclear missiles. It's not going out of control. He is giving it constant attention and constant upkeep in his mighty providential way. Aren't you glad that the Bible tells us about a God like that? So we're going to begin today by just giving thanks for God's providence. In just a moment when we go to prayer, we're going to pray for these needs we have. We're also going to just thank God that he is providentially at work. He is giving care. He is maintaining, sustaining, preserving everything until he's ready for it to be done. And he'll bring it to the ends that he desires it to come to. Before we go any further, though, let's, when Pastor Trey, you keep saying providence, what in the world does that word mean? Here's the definition that we've been working with over the last several weeks. And let's read this together. Would you mind? Providence means that God is involved in he helps the, and makes use of the, and he does this in a way that, one, preserves his creation, two, answers our prayers, and three, brings about his salvation plans all at the same time. He's upholding all creation. He's 
factoring in our prayers and petitions, and he's moving things while human beings are making free choices. He's bumping them and nudging them in the direction that he wants to take it to save his people. And he's doing that all at the same time. Would someone say providence? Okay, here's our scripture memory verse we've been working on. It's from Romans 8, 28. Would you guys please stand with me and we'll do this as an act of worship or we'll read God's word here together. We've been focusing on this passage and we've been focusing on what it means and what it doesn't mean. Right, everyone? And so we've been working on clarifying that. And if you have questions about any of this, once again, I really, really want to talk to you. And if you visit with me after church to talk about, bounce off some of these ideas, and we stand talking together, then I don't have to tear down ch chairs and stuff, okay? So just keep that in the back of your mind as a sub point, all right? Let's, uh, let's read this together. All things work together for good to those who love God. All things. All things. And all the people said, Amen. Now, I'm going to invite you just to take a moment to be seated, to maybe pray there. I really, you feel free to pray alone. Feel free. Sometimes we need to be alone, don't we? But I really want to encourage others of us to go around, go let the Spirit move you, go find somebody and sit down with them. Maybe go find somebody that's alone and say, Hey, can I just pray with you? And uh, you might do this as families, you might do this in small groups, you might do this in deacon groups, you might do this in just, you're sitting close together, or you might just want to do it alone, that's fine, but let's just take a couple minutes all over the room to thank God for his providence, thank him for being involved, thank him for being at work, and then uh, throw these prayer needs we have out before him as well. Can we do that together? Ready, set, break.
all the people said. Thank you, church, for praying and ministering to one another. Would you turn to Genesis chapter 49 with me? Jacob, whose name is also Israel, is the one whose boys are going to grow up and become a nation. Jacob is now an old man. He's working on 147 years old. And he has given his last words to his sons. And now he has one final instruction for them in chapter 49, verse 29. He says, I charge you or I command you boys, you got to do this one last thing for me. I want you to take me up and I want you to bury me in the promised land. My family's buried there. I want to be buried there. My heart is there. I want you to bury me there. Because he's in Egypt and he knows that God had made this promise and God's going to keep his promise to bring the people of God into their own land there in Canaan, in Israel. Promise me you'll bury me there. Of course, you got to do that. At that point, in verse 33, Jacob had finished commanding his sons, and he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. In chapter 50, verse, verse 1, immediately Joseph just falls on his dad, weeping. And you know throughout these passages, Joseph has been pretty choked up several times. And this just shows us another one of those times. And he's weeping. So where are they again? Which country are they in? Egypt. And this is the middle kingdom of Egypt. This is the ancient Egypt. And so Joseph has his dad, Jacob, embalmed and probably also mummified. And then goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, please give me permission to uh, take dad and bury him in the promised land just as he's asked for. And Pharaoh says, of course. Of course, not only that. But I'm going to send you an escort of some of my finest charioteers, and we're going to have something of a parade, leaving Egypt, traveling north up into the promised land. And so Joseph and his brothers and their families and, se and several Egyptians as well all make their way up north and they have this time of mourning, and uh, they bury Jacob in the promised land just as he had asked them. And sure enough, uh, Joseph keeps his promise and comes back down to Egypt where he knows he's going to finish out his days. And when that happens, this, probably through this whole ordeal of burying Jacob, Joseph's brothers begin to get an idea, an awful idea, an idea that actually Esau, their ancestor, had too. I don't know if you guys remember the story of Esau and Jacob. But Esau was so mad at Jacob, he said to himself, and evidently he was overheard saying this, that I'll wait till my dad Isaac dies, and when he dies, Jacob is a dead man. I'm going to hunt him down, and I'm going to kill him. And Joseph's brothers are thinking this exact thing about Joseph. They didn't know whether or not Joseph was just being nice to them because dad was still around, right? Right? And so they began to, this grew into a fear and a worry and, and a kind of hopelessness in their minds because they knew they were completely at the whim of Joseph. Joseph is the big man, the head honcho down in Egypt. He only answers to Pharaoh. And so we, we uh, come to verse 15 of chapter 50, and this is our passage for today. 50 verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, you know what? Perhaps Joseph is going to hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Did they do anything bad to Joseph? No, sum it up. What did they do? What did they do? Yeah, they were to get rid of him, kill him. No, 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 that killing him is not profitable. Let's sell him, right? And that's how he ends up in Egypt. That's how, by the way, Israel ends up in Egypt, um, Come the next book of the Bible, and Moses, and the next huge event in their life. But anyway, yeah, they did some pretty bad things. So they think, ah, he's going to hate us. Dad's dead. There's nothing keeping him from killing us. So we better come up with something. Now, scheming and conniving runs in their blood, right? They're just true to their roots here because that's exactly what their dad was like. So in verse 16, they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, it was dad's last wish 
that, you know, all of us just get along, you know, because this is a tender moment. I don't know if Jacob actually said this, but I'm thinking this is probably a little bit of a trick. Verse 17. Uh, before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. you got, Joseph, you got to be the bigger man. You know, it was dad's, dad's last wish that you would just forgive us of everything. Now, please forgive the trespasses of the, listen to this, trespasses of the servants of the God of your father, right? Linking this all we do the exact same thing. We bring God into all kinds of stuff we do, right? Linking it all to God, and we just serve, you know, we just serve God, and, and we just want to keep serving God, and um, this was Dad's last wish. And when Joseph heard it, what did he do? He gets choked up again, right? I don't know why, but maybe because you guys don't realize I've, man, I've changed. I've moved beyond all that. I was hoping you'd change, and that's a lot of water under the bridge now, and so Joseph wept when they spoke to him. In verse 18, Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. They bowed down before him, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Yeah. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Look, guys, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? It's not my place to punish you. This is a lot bigger than me. And then listen to what he says. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, you know, when you read that, you've got to be careful because you immediately go, oh, see, God is directly responsible for all the horrible things that happened in Joseph's life. Did God allow these things to happen? Yeah. Who did, who did the action to Joseph? His brothers, okay? That's what the Bible tells us. So God allowed it. God knew what was going on. It didn't surprise him. But as Joseph reflects on it, what does he realize? Was it all just dumb luck that he ended up where he was? No. That even though they meant something evil, God could take it and turn it to make something good. Aren't you glad that that's what providence teaches? That's going to come back into our message later today, okay? You meant it for evil, but God just took it, turned it right around, made something good out of it. Now, therefore, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And that was just the, that was just the main thing that he said. But he went on to talk to them further and comfort them, and he spoke kindly to them. In other words, Joseph is saying, look, guys, I've changed. I've changed. I'm not going to get my revenge against you. I'm not going to avenge myself of you. I'm a changed man. Somebody help me. What has changed him? How is he able to reflect on, before we think too lightly of this, these were horrible years for a 17-year-old to be sold into slavery, taken away to a foreign land, th never to see his family again, as far as he knows, he'll never see them again. And dad, he knows his dad's thinking he's dead. Right? He's gone forever. These are horrible things. Why is he reflecting on it this way? What has happened to his thinking? He's seen God's providence. God is at, he's seen God at work. God's been involved in this whole thing. And this has changed Joseph's perspective on it, hasn't it? In other words, providence has given Joseph a new perspective on the evil that his brothers did to him and on them as the evildoers. He said, wow, providence isn't just some academic theological thing just some point to make philosophically. You mean providence actually affects how I think about my life and my attitude towards others? Everybody? Absolutely it does. Did it affect Joseph? Absolutely it did. So Joseph realizes now that, that because of providence, he has a new perspective on evil. A new perspective on evil. And this is my only point for us today that providence can also give us a new perspective on evil. So what do you mean by perspective? I mean that when evil happens, our view of things becomes very myopic. Like we're looking through a rifle scope. We can only see this much. And we're just focusing on the evil. And we don't see anything else that's going around us. But providence causes us to kind of be lifted up and to look at the big picture 
And when we look at the big picture, all of a sudden our attitude towards the evil and the evildoers begins to change. Isn't that what changed Joseph? Isn't that what he reflects when he says this in verse 20? He, he, he's able to interpret what has happened to him in a way that Joseph's brothers did not interpret. Joseph gets it, and they don't. Has he said this before? You guys remember? Have we talked about this before? Yeah, this was chapter 45 where he did the same thing. Joseph is repeating his interpretation of the things that have happened to him, and in his interpretation of them, the evil was kind of part of something bigger that was going on. In other words, his perspective on it had changed because he had developed a view of what we call providence. God was involved. God was at work. Someone say it. Providence. So will you read this with me? Providence can give us... And we better say that one more time because this is really big. Providence can... Now I'm going to give you three things that will just kind of go along with this round this out that come from our passage and it might be a good idea to kind of jot these down in your own words because it's very likely that you can use them this week you might be using them on somebody who comes to Thanksgiving dinner and says well I don't believe in God because how do you explain this bad thing and that bad thing you might be able to use some of these then but I want to use an illustration that I hope really helps that's why these red dots are up here, Cal. Cal was like, why are those big red dots up there? Well, I'm going to tell you. Because when you're a kid, um, your view of evil, I don't know, probably the average kid, your view of evil is like this big, right? It's my evil, Aaron. Like, it's out there, but, you know, mom and dad are so much bigger than it, and Superman's bigger than it, and God's bigger. So it can be beaten. It's out there. But as we get older... We start to focus on the evil, don't we? Especially evil that happens to us. And then, when that happens, it begins to grow. In our, it begins to get bigger and bigger. And it's almost like a, a floater. How many of you have floaters in your eyeballs? You were, you're laughing. You were already thinking of that, okay? So I'm not the only weird one. And this person over here said, yeah, you are. I have no idea what you're talking about. But it's, it's like a floater that you, you can't, I'm looking at you, but actually right now is right in front of you. It's hard to see. It's kind of hard to see you right because I'm focusing on this evil. It's getting bigger. I'm starting to be afraid of it. I'm starting to think, man, I've got to avenge it. I'm starting to think, ah, oh, there's not much hope. And as I do that, I focus more and more on it, just exactly what had happened to Joseph's brothers. The more I focus on it, the more I think about it, and the more I'm afraid of it, and the more I want to avenge it, and the more I, I lose hope because of it, the bigger it gets. Until I think, I'm thinking just like Joseph's brothers think, man, he's going to kill us all because he's thinking like we think. Just like o Esau thought, you know, I, when I'm just, I got to avenge this evil. This evil has happened to me, and it's so big, and it's. And my, you know, my anxieties are growing, but I think, well, I'm justified. I've got to, I, I've got to avenge this thing. And then it becomes so big that this is all I see. And man, I just stay at home then, curled up in a ball. Evil is so big. It's dominating everything. Anxieties are crushing me because evil has become bigger than anything else that's going on. But I want to just use this as an illustration today that God has taught us about his providence to tell us that providence shrinks this. Not until it's totally gone, but shrinks it. And I want to just kind of show you how I think it does with a few more corny illustrations. Here's the first thing it does. In this passage, we see that Joseph's take on evil is that evil can actually be used for some good. Evil may be used for some good. Will you guys say this with me? Evil may be used for some good. Is that what Joseph believed about what happened to him? 
Yes. So that makes everything Joseph's brothers did to him okay. Help me quick, 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 quick. Was, was it sin? Should they have done it? Absolutely not. Will they be held accountable for it? Absolutely. But God created a universe in which human beings can make free choices. But don't underestimate his ability to take evil and make use of it for some good. One more time. Evil may be used for some good. That's exactly what he's saying in verse 20. How many of you have ever been to a scrapyard? Yeah, right, salvage yard? For how many of you is that just a treasure planet? Okay, I don't know. You look at some of this gnarled metal and you think, that can't be used for anything. And then you walk into some cool restaurant or store and they've decorated with it. Like, wow, I never would have thought to, exactly, you never would have thought, but yes, it can be done. And sometimes it has to be melted down to make use, but you could s- still make some use of it. I'm not saying that every act of evil may be used for some good. Some evil just exists because we, God created a universe in which allowed it, right? Otherwise, he would be making us all automatons and doing all automatic, and he would, it would just be a Christian fate, and every, whatever will be, will be. But God didn't. God created a universe in which he allowed us to make evil, and we've made it. But we have a God who can take it and turn it and switch it into something good. So that when Satan tries to destroy you and crush you and perplex you and come in from all sides, here's what can happen according to the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, very first chapter, is that Satan comes at you. I was using a dumb illustration with David last week, Donnie where um, my cousin and I used to talk about what we called old man kung fu. You guys know old man kung fu? Help me out, Mr. Miyagi kung fu. You know, how much energy does Mr. Miyagi put into a fight? Like, like sloth-like energy, right? This, I guess this is for the guys, Jonathan. This is just for the guys today, Nathan. Right, your attacker comes at you, and you're like, the old man kung fu is this. Right? Then they're in, and they're in flip-flops doing all this, right? And this guy is big and bulking, and the, and the old man kung fu is like, and they fall and they fly through the wall, right? This may be totally useless illustration, but for me it works, so you're going to have to suffer through it. So, Satan brings in this thing that, oh, it's designed to pound you. It's designed to pulverize you. It's designed to get you to turn your back on Jesus altogether, and then the Lord goes in. He didn't desire that thing to happen to you. He didn't put his blessing on that thing happening to you. But he sees it coming at you. Like Job, he knows, he knows what you're made of. He's at work in you like a mighty lion of the Holy Spirit. And he takes that thing that came into you to crush you. And he goes like this. And turns it. And what do you end up doing with it as a Christian? You get victory over it, you pray through it, you come out the other side of it, and then what do you do? You use that to witness and build up others, and now what Satan meant for evil has just come back on top of his head. Right? Okay? So what has that begun to do? Because now you stop and go, evil just happened to me. Oh, it's so big, I hate it, and, and I've got to avenge it, and I'm afraid of it, and I'm losing hope because of it. And then you read the passage of Scripture, wait, 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 that's right. Evil may be used for some good. Providence says evil may be used for some good. And it gets a little bit smaller. Maybe it's not as earth-shattering as I thought it was. Maybe it's not as horrible as I thought it was. Maybe it's not the end of my life like I thought it was. And it begins to shrink just a little bit. How many of you know there's two more bullets coming? There's two more points coming, right? Right? Come on, there's two more, because this is still a lot to live with, isn't it? Fl- floaters out there, this is not, I can't hardly see you most of the time. This is still a lot to live with. Here's another thing, and this has to do with evil doers. Evil doers may be part of some bigger plan. They don't realize it. I don't think Satan even realizes it, but they may be part of some bigger plan. Will you guys say this with me? Evil doers may be used as part of a bigger plan. This was the one that I think made the biggest impact on me. Did Joseph need to hate his brothers? Did Joseph need to avenge himself against his brothers? What's his view about his brothers? You idiots were just 
part, being used as part of a bigger plan. I'm not going to hate you because of it. It just doesn't seem like Jesus hated Judas. Judas, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is awful, and I'd hate to be in your shoes. But it just doesn't seem like Jesus hated Judas for maybe being a part of a bigger plan. So I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to hate other people because they're doing evil to me. And you know what that means? I don't realize it, but all of a sudden, this thing has shrunk just a little bit more. And how many of you know there's one more coming? Right? Because this is still kind of big to live with. Right? It's still big to live with. Here's the third thing. This is the most important. You say it with me. Evil will not stop God from keeping his promises. Evil will not stop God from keeping his promises. Look with me at verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and shall carry, you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph died believing what? That God would keep his promises, right? Did the brother's evil stop the promises of God? God made a promise. He would use the family of Abraham to bring, yes, they would have a promised land. Yes, they would have descendants, but to bring salvation blessings on the nations. And Joseph died believing he's going to keep those promises. And when he does, I want you to bury me. You say it. Bury me. One more time. Bury me in the promised land because, say it, evil will not stop God from keeping his promises promises. Grandpa Hensley, Thomas S. Hensley, the very first, ace, taught us to play setback. How many of you know how to play setback? It's very similar to pinochle, I guess. Um, and we would sit around playing, so we loved this. Thanksgiving was this time where after we ate, we'd sit around playing cards. And no matter how I was trying to win, he would start chuckling. I'd throw down the very first play, very first card, he would start chuckling and say, oh, you're playing right into my hands now, Trey. You're playing right into my hands now. And I was like, what? What does he mean? I don't, how did I play? I don't even know how he played into your hands. What does that mean, that expression? Help the younger people out. What does that mean? Yeah, I wanted you to do that all along. Like I can, and I can, I'm just going to make use of what you're doing against you. Right? Isn't that kind of what that means? Am I right? I don't know. Am I close on that one? My grandpa would say, hey, you're just, and I throw down this, well, I got him on the second card, because boom, here comes the off jack. Oh, you're just playing right in my hands now, Trey. I don't, he won sometimes. I mean, you know, <laughs> he won sometimes. But how many of you know, no matter what's, I mean, okay, this is worth your money, everything you paid to come to church today. Your ticket into church today. This is what scripture teaches over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Satan may think he's doing this. Evil people may think they're doing this. But evil will not stop God from keeping his promises. In fact, if anything, help me out. It's just playing right into his hands. Satan thinks, oh, he's so diabolical. He is so bad. He's just so bad. Father God said, <laughs> can't believe you did that. You're just playing right into my hands. Joseph's brothers think, oh, let's get rid of this guy. <sighs> You're just playing right into my hands. And then all of a sudden, evil shrinks just a little bit more. My anxieties about it shrink. My fear of it shrinks. My hatred and vengeful spirit towards other shrinks because I don't have to avenge myself of them anymore. My hopelessness, that shrinks. And it's, it's still there, isn't it? It's still there floating around, right? But this is what providence does to us. It shrinks it by giving us a new perspective 
on evil. That's just three things. We've learned about 50 of these. I'm going to try to compile them for you at some point. But would you say the main point with me one last time? Providence can give us a new perspective on evil. Can you use that today? Can you use that maybe this week? Can somebody use that? Some of this has been kind of up here. But can you see how it comes down into here? Rubber meets me. Can you see that, everybody? You with me? I would love to talk to you afterwards in the cafe over some snacks while everybody's moving chairs around. I'd love to talk to you some more about this. Just give me a reason to talk these things with you. But let me, uh, you got to give me a minute. You got to give me a minute now to finish the entire book of Genesis. Can you do that? Do you see, do you see the last verse? Do you see it? Scan down at it one last time. I'll give you a second. Scan down at it one last time. Very last verse. Why'd you make me read that? This is why. Genesis begins with a man walking in a beautiful garden. Evergreen. Genesis ends with a man in a dusty Egyptian coffin. And you're one of those people. You're not like Katie. But you're like me in high school. You read the first chapter and the last chapter to do your book report on the whole book. When you read the last chapter, you were like, wait. Say it. What in the world happened? What did you people do? You went from here to, is that important to know what? Because when you look around you and you listen to the news, you go, wait, what, what has happened? What has happened? Here's the story. God creates a universe. For his reasons, he creates a world in which human beings will have the ability to freely choose to obey him and love him or disobey him and reject him. You can do that, whatever you want to do, because he would rather have a people that love him because they love him, just like you and I. We don't want to force people to do that. So he creates a universe in which they do it. Puts them in a garden. Says you may eat of any of the trees. Just don't eat of this one. That's your choice. That's your choice. The fruit, don't eat of this one. They eat of that one. And sin comes into the world. The end. Immediately, what do we see? Providence. Death comes into the world, sin comes into the world, human beings have a big problem, and it's not fulfilling their dreams. It's not finding the person of their dreams. Their big problem now is, say it again, Howie, death. That's the big problem. Death has come into the world, and God immediately flies into action and says in Genesis chapter 3, yes, the serpent has done this, but the woman is going to have a child, and one day this child will crush the head of the serpent, even though he'll strike his heel, and telling us from the very beginning, God has a plan that he's working to save and to rescue. And sure enough, there's, God begins to work with families. The family of Adam, and then the family of Seth. And from the family of Seth, the family of Noah. From the family of Noah, the family of Shem. From the family of Shem, a man named Abraham. And now he's working specifically, targeted with Abraham. From Abraham, Isaac. From Isaac, Jacob. And a promise that's repeated over and over again. From you, I'm gonna, from this family, I'm going to bring about a savior king one day, and I'm going to preserve it, and I'm going to uphold it because people are fragile and frail, but I'm going to uphold it providentially, moving, acting, working, and the, one day Moses will come, and the nation of Israel will receive the law, and from that time prophets will come, and they'll say, a savior king is on his way, and then the savior king will be born in Bethlehem, just like the prophets say. And he'll live a perfect life and die on the cross. And then be raised again the third day so that everyone who believes on him would not have to perish but can have everlasting life. And the Bible says that all of God's promises are fulfilled up and amen in Jesus. And the story ain't over yet. And Jesus leaves and says, I'm going away, but I'm leaving you with a job to do. I want you to live out this good news and I want you to preach this good news to everybody until I come back. And keep meeting together in little churches because you've got to build each other up. And keep doing this. 
Have I kept my promises in the past? Yes, you have, Master. Will I keep my promises to come in the future? Yes, you will, Master. That's what's happened. And all the people said, let's take a minute to pray together. Be quiet. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to ask you if you just take a minute where you are. Say, Father God, you got my attention. What's my next step? You got my attention. What's my next step? All over the room, let's take just a minute and spend some time praying to God. This is, I'm out of this. This is between you and him now. The urgings that you're feeling, that's not from Trey. That's from the Holy Spirit. God is calling you to do something, and it's time to figure out what that is. All over the room.